Greetings from Latter-day Media, presenting our dear friend and epic historian on Joseph Smith and church history. This podcast starts a special series called Passport to Heaven. This is part two. From 1841 to 1843. Brother K. Godfrey. Welcome back. Today's uh, podcast is going to be very unique. We're going to cover some really interesting uh, subjects. In particular, we're going to uh, kind of get into the Masonic Order and the role the Masons have played in the history of the church. And we're also going to discuss polygamy and my take on polygamy and how polygamy perhaps saved the church. So we'll go ahead and begin um, our presentation today. Again, Passport to Heaven, Part 2, 1841 through 1843. On January the 5th, 1842, Joseph opened a red brick store. Uh, This store was located on Water Street. The slide shows a before and after kind of a a look. Uh, It would become the central gathering place for the saints. Many important decisions and instructions and ordinances would be uh, received at the red brick store. This wasn't Joseph's first red brick store. You remember from a prior podcast, Joseph's first mercantile store was located in Kirtland, across the street from his home. Joseph loved to visit the courageous converts who had recently immigrated from England, as well as the established members in the outlying branches of the church. On January the 8th, 1842, Joseph had an interesting visitor while on a visit to Plymouth to visit his brother Samuel and sister Catherine Salisbury. The visitor was a man named Royalty. He had invented a machine that he felt would revolutionize warfare for the next 300 years. It was a steam-driven vessel that could throw a cannonball 300 feet and shoot liquid fire. Observations of the enemy was done by an uh, inboard telescope. Joseph found the details of the invention interesting. However, he felt that the invention should be used for some other purpose other than national defense. Joseph found time for his family and close friends. On his and Emma's anniversary on January the 18th, a large dinner party was held at the mansion house. There were 74 guests invited. It was a jubilee and commemorated Joseph's marriage to Emma 16 years earlier. In the spring of 1842, Joseph began publishing the translation from the record of Abraham, which was acquired in 1835. Extracts from the book of Abraham appeared in the Times and Seasons and in its British equivalent, the Millennial Star. On March 17, 1842, the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo was organized. Emma Smith was president. Elizabeth Ann Whitney and Sarah Cleveland were counselors. Elvira Cowles was made treasurer, and Eliza R. Snow was called a secretary. The prophet said, quote, The church was never perfectly organized until the women were thus organized. By the time of Joseph's death in 1844, the Relief Society had grown to over 1,300 women. Today, the Relief Society is the largest women's organization in the world, with over 7 million members in over 188 countries. The Relief Society motto, Charity Never Faileth, was taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. In March of 1842, another important institution was established, Freemasonry. Many church leaders were Masons prior to joining the church. Freemasonry is an international society preaching brotherliness, charity, and mutual aid. This is a good union for the church and in harmony with the teachings of Joseph. On March 15, 1842, the Grand Master Abraham Jonas of Columbus granted authority for Nauvoo to have its own Masonic Lodge. The Rising Sun Lodge of the ancient York Masons soon became the largest in the state. Lucia Scoville, a Scoville Bakery, donated the land for the building of the Masonic Hall. Its building would be dedicated in April of 1844 with over 550 members in attendance. Eventually, it would grow to over 1,500 members and again be the largest in the state of Illinois. 
That same day, Joseph received the first degree in Freemasonry. The next day, he was made a third degree Mason, the highest level in the York Rite. This effect would link Joseph <clears throat> and the church to many influential individuals who could help the saints' cause. In explaining the church's involvement in Freemasonry, look no farther than Joseph simply asking, what is this all about? It's evident that the Masonic ritual embraces a few features that resemble the rudimentary ceremonies of the temple endowment, yet these few points of similarity are largely restricted to the rituals pertaining to the Aaronic priesthood. The inspired rituals of the Melchizedek priesthood are entirely unknown to them. In point of fact, quote, the temple endowment transcends the Masonic ritual to the point that they are more unalike than alike. Heber C. Kimball recorded that after Joseph became a Mason, he explained to the brethren that Masonry had its origin from the priesthood. Franklin D. Richards, who became an apostle in 1849, stated, Joseph the prophet was aware that there were some things about masonry that had come down from the beginning, and he desired to know what they were, hence the lodge. Now, masonry did not initiate, let me emphasize that again, did not initiate the temple endowment. From June 1830 to February 1831, Joseph was translating the Bible. During this time, he received a revelation called the Book of Moses. Now, to a great extent, it contains portions of the complete temple endowment. The phrase temple appears 191 times in the Bible. Malachi speaks of, quote, the Lord coming quickly to the temple and turning the hearts of the children to their fathers. In Corinthians, we learn of baptism for the dead. First Peter teaches of spirits in prison. Nehemiah speaks of a recorded genealogy in the temple. The first three chapters of Genesis relate the creation story. God says in Genesis, quote, This is a token of the covenant I have made between you and me. Exodus tells of Aaron being washed and anointed prior to having the holy garments placed upon him. Numbers talks about the laying on of hands. Isaiah and Revelations talk about the new name. Revelations also tells us that we are to become kings and priests, as well as not to defile our garments. Well, after the Savior's appearance in the Kirtland Temple on March 27, 1836, a partial endowment was administered with Washington anointings. On January the 18th, 1842, three months prior to masonry being established in Nauvoo, Joseph was given a revelation to build a temple. In it, he was told, quote, Let this house be built unto my name, that I may reveal mine ordinances therein unto my people. For I plan to reveal unto my church things which have been kept hid from before the foundations of the world. Well, in 1844, the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge was severed from the Illinois Grand Lodge for alleged improprieties and because of jealous anti-Mormon Masonic members from surrounding lodges. Masonry was then discontinued once the saints left for the Rocky Mountains. It was no longer needed. On April 16th, the WASP weekly newspaper was published. William Smith was its editor. The paper had political overtones and was used to rebuff the accusations made by Thomas Sharp in the Warsaw Signal. In late April, Joseph was inspired to introduce the first temple ordinances. On April 28, 1842, at a meeting of the newly organized Female Relief Society, Joseph spoke of delivering the keys of the priesthood to the church and to faithful sisters who should receive them in connection with their husbands. This was the first reference to the administration of the sacred temple ordinances. On May 4, 1842, the first temple endowment an introduction to the concept of eternal marriage was given to a few select friends of the prophet. The first nine men were endowed in the upper room of Joseph's red brick store. They were Hiram Smith, William Law, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Willard Richards, William Marks, 
Newell K. Whitney, George Miller, and Judge James Adams. Brigham Young wrote of receiving his washing anointings and endowments. This was a grand and glorious opportunity for these brethren. Others would soon follow. Unfortunately, some would never appreciate the significance of the experience and will someday have to answer for their disobedience. On May 6th, ex-governor Lalburn Boggs was shot while he was at home in Independence, Missouri. Although he was severely injured, he was not killed. Joseph and Oren Porter Rockwell would be accused in the assassination attempt. There was also mischief afoot on the battlegrounds. On May 7th, the Nauvoo Legion fought a sham battle outside of Nauvoo, in which John C. Bennett conspired to have the prophet killed during the battle. Well, the still soft whisperings of the spirit saved Joseph's life. John C. Bennett's true colors were now showing. Joseph had suspected him and others in a conspiracy, and now the evidence was beginning to come forth. John C. Bennett joined the church 18 months earlier. He had a professed love for the gospel, but in reality never believed anything relative to the restored church. After his botched attempt on Joseph's life, and because of numerous rumors circulating about his moral conduct, John C. Bennett's time in the sun was gone. On May 19th, Joseph was elected mayor of Nauvoo, replacing John C. Bennett. And in June of 1842, John C. Bennett was excommunicated for immoral conduct. On the eve of Bennett's marrying a Nauvoo woman, it was found out that he already had a wife and children, and he had deserted them in the east. Well, he soon left Nauvoo about a month later and set about to start to destroy the church and the prophet Joseph Smith. Now, others of this clandestine movement would soon be uh, dealt with appropriately. Oh, let me start that okay. last little bit over, okay? Um, shall I start that whole section over, Mike? Uh, it's up to you. I will. I will. Okay. John C. Bennett joined the church 18 months earlier. Uh, because of a professed love for the church. However, he never had any love at all for the restored gospel. After his botched attempt on Joseph's life, and because of numerous rumors circulating about his moral conduct, John C. Bennett's time in the sun was over. On May 19th, Joseph was elected mayor of Nauvoo, replacing John C. Bennett. And in June of 1842, Bennett was excommunicated for immoral conduct. On the eve of Bennett's marrying a Nauvoo woman, it was found out that he already had a wife and children that he has deserted in the east. Well, he left Nauvoo later in the month and set about to destroy the prophet Joseph Smith. Now, others of this clandestine group would also soon be cut off from the church. In fact, the lawyer, Chauncey L. Higby, was excommunicated from the church for unchaste conduct involving four young girls caught in his deceit and misrepresentation. Now, his involvement with the conspirators would likewise soon be known to all. So the purging process, the purging process had begun again. Joseph was continually trying to perfect the saints. Many times this would involve purging those who had an evil heart. On July 20th, 1842, Lalburn Boggs swore in an affidavit that Oren Porter Rockwell had tried to kill him, and Joseph Smith was an accessory before the act. Oren once made the statement, quote, I could not have been involved, for if I was, he would be dead. On August the 6th, while in Montrose, Iowa, at the installation of the officers of the Rising Sun Lodge of the ancient York Masons, Joseph made a very remarkable prophecy. Quote, the saints would be driven to the Rocky Mountains, where they would become a mighty people. Now, interestingly enough, he did not include himself in the fulfillment of this particular prophecy. On August the 8th, the prophet and Oren Porter Rockwell were taken into custody for the attempted assassination of Lalburn Boggs. The uh, arresting sheriff from the governor's office was afraid to obey or disobey the order to arrest Joseph uh, because Joseph had produced a writ of habeas corpus, which, which demanded that he be tried literally in Nauvoo. 
So this arresting officer, not knowing what to do, rushed away to consult with Governor Carlin of Illinois, who was actually in league with Governor Thomas Reynolds of Missouri. When he returned to rearrest Joseph, he was gone. Joseph had hidden to escape imprisonment. They had fled to a nearby island in the middle of the Mississippi. Now, over the next three months, Joseph would hide in a variety of homes throughout Nauvoo to escape these illegal warrants. Now, while hiding, Joseph wrote a number of important addresses to the saints on the subject of baptism for the dead. The prophet had the time to contemplate, who are my friends? Who are my friends? On August the 23rd, 1842, the prophet decided to record their names in his book that he'd entitled, quote, The Book of the Law of the Lord. Now, a few of the names that he recorded and wrote brief comments on were Joseph Knight Sr., Newell Knight, Joseph Knight Jr., and Orm Porter Rockwell, about whom he said, quote, My soul loves him. He also included, of course, Joseph Smith Sr., Lucy Mack Smith, Alvin Smith, Don Carlos Smith, and Hiram Smith. On December the 26th, after nearly three months of hiding, Joseph submitted himself to be arrested. When the Supreme Court of Illinois ruled that the writ he had filed in Nauvoo was illegal. On January the 2nd, 1843, as Joseph waited trial, he prophesied that he would never be taken to Missouri, dead or alive. Now, at the trial on January the 4th, Joseph was proven innocent for the third time and acquitted of being an accessory to the shooting of Boggs. Joseph could now finally enjoy a brief moment of peace. He spent some quiet time during the month of February studying the German language. He had always said that the, uh, that the German version of the King James edition of the Bible was the most correct. Joseph found time now for his family and close friends. In fact, on February the 8th, he spent the day sliding on the ice with his son Frederick, who at the time was six years old. Joseph continued to have close contact with the heavens. On February the 9th, Joseph received what is known today as Doctrine and Covenants section 129, a really interesting section of the Doctrine and Covenants, which states the way in which angels, just men made perfect, and evil spirits can be discerned. On Saturday, March the 4th, Orem Porter Rockwell was apprehended in St. Louis by the Missourians for the attempted murder of Boggs. It would be 10 months before Joseph would see his good friend again. However, on March the 15th, Joseph prophesied, quote, Orem Porter Rockwell would get away honorably from the Missourians. On April the 2nd, while visiting the outlying community of Ramus, Joseph Smith received a revelation found in Doctrine and Covenants section 130. It stated many great truths in this particular prophecy, such as, Quote, the Father has a body of flesh and bone, as tangible as man. The more knowledge and intelligence a person could gain in this life, he would have so much the advantage in the world to come. And, when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. Joseph would give over 200 such sermons that would shape the saints' understanding of gospel doctrines and immeasurably influence the church. Now, of interest to Joseph, the, quote, amateur archaeologist, was the discovery of some really unique metal plates found on April 23, 1843. There were six brass plates and supposedly a skeleton found by a Mr. R. Wiley near Kinderhook, Pike County, Illinois. Joseph hoped that this would validate the existence of ancient plates like those of the Book of Mormon. Anti-Mormons hoped to trick Joseph into translating these hoaxed plates. However, he never stepped into the trap. These are really interesting. I've seen, I've seen these before. This particular slide, the Kinder Book, Kinderhook plates sketched um, by an unknown artist and published in the periodical Times and Seasons. This is the front and back of each six plates, and you can see these sketchings and etchings. And there was supposedly a large uh, skeleton found as a man dug 
in this uh, in this particular mound site in Kinderhook. And uh, again, they were brought to Joseph in an attempt to have him translate them and trick him because they were they were hoax, they were faked. But Joseph the prophet, knowing this, did not get engaged in the uh, in the tra- actual translation of what was on these bell-shaped brass plates. Now, in May, the uh, the newspaper, the Wasp, took on a new and friendlier name. It was now be called the Nauvoo Neighbor. Its editor was John Taylor, about whom Joseph said, quote, John's only sin in life is that he could not spell. That would be really difficult to be the editor of the newspaper and not be able to spell. The first edition was circulated on May 3rd, 1843, the Nauvoo Neighbor. In mid-May, Joseph traveled to Ramus, Illinois, for another conference. On his way home, he stopped in Carthage and had dinner with Judge Stephen A. Douglas. And while there, Joseph prophesied that Judge Douglas would aspire to the presidency of the United States. But if he ever turned against the saints, he would feel the hand of the Almighty. Well, unfortunately, history tells us that Judge Douglas did run for the presidency, and under pressure, he did turn against the saints in the Utah War. He was beaten badly in the election, even though he was the favored candidate. Abraham Lincoln was the winner of that particular election. Judge Douglas died six weeks after his defeat. On May 26, Joseph readministered the temple endowment to the same individuals he had a year earlier, giving them further light and knowledge. This time, however, he included Emma, his wife. On September 28, 1843, Emma would become the first female to receive the endowment. On June 8, 1843, a good friend of Joseph's passed away. His name was Elias Higby. He was an avid supporter of the cause of the saints, and he accompanied the prophet to Washington, D.C., and showed great courage as he stood before the Senate and virtually argued the saints' cause by himself. In the book, The Law of the Lord, Joseph wrote about Elias Higby and said, His course is approved. Unfortunately, that could not be said about Elias Higby's sons. It seems that this point, particular point in time, the Higby brothers started to turn on Joseph. Francis and Chauncey L. Higby were men of importance in the community. Chauncey was a lawyer and Francis was a justice of the peace. Chauncey, however, had been excommunicated from the church in May of 1842 for unchastity. Francis was also an adulterer. However, his excommunication was not formalized until May of 1844. I want to direct your attention to this slide for a moment. And for those of you that are audio only, I'm going to read a part of this. I think this is really interesting, taken from uh, the newspaper and, and listing the deaths of individuals and how they died. It said, deaths for the week ending Monday the 15th, Hiram J. Perry was an infant. Deaths for the week ending Monday the 22nd, Holclad, Holclad, colored woman, 55 years, consumption. Deaths for the week ending Monday the 12th. Here you have Elias Higby, 47 years old, from inflammation of the bowels. Mary Ellen Henderson, four months, fever. Lorena Hoare, 11 years old, nervous fever. Deaths for the week ending Monday the 19th. M.S. Loveland, one year, fits. Robert R. Tripp, 50 years, consumption. Eliza A. Mills, 29 years, nervous fever. Ellen M. Webb, four months, canker. Jane Ferrer, seven years, canker. Mary Ann Bailey, two years, dropsy. George Carr, a 10-year-old, apparently drowned. Deaths for the week ending Monday the 26th, Elizabeth Jane Smith, 10 months, measles. I just share that with you to to show you the variety of issues and challenges, um, at least health-wise, that these good folks in Nauvoo had. A lot of people pass away from a lot of different things. All of those terms reflect some other term that we would call the same illness today. For example, consumption is tuberculosis. And perhaps as we go through our, the balance of our Nauvoo podcast, I'll allude to some of these things and, and do the comparison so you know what we're talking about here.
Anyway, Elias Higby, good friend of the prophet Joseph. On June the 13th, Joseph and Emma left on a trip. They went to Dixon, Lee County, Illinois. They're going to go visit Emma's sister, who was living there at the time. Now, Joseph H. Reynolds, a sheriff from Jackson County, Missouri, and Constable Her Harmon T. Wilson of Carthage, Illinois, were given a writ signed by Governors Reynolds of Missouri and Governor Ford of Illinois and told to go and arrest Joseph. This was done at the urging of John C. Bennett, who had now joined the Missouri forces trying to capture Joseph. I find this really interesting, and this particular slide kind of reflects this this involvement of two states trying to um, trying to arrest Joseph. You got Lalbern Boggs, the governor of Missouri, from 36 to 40, was the first to attempt to arrest Joseph. And then you got a combination of Boggs and Carlin. Carlin's the governor of the state of Illinois from 38 to 42, trying to arrest Joseph. And then you got Reynolds, who's now the governor of Missouri, conspiring with Carlin, the governor of Illinois, for a third time to arrest Joseph. And now you've got a fourth time. You've got Reynolds, the governor of Missouri, with Ford, who's now the governor of Illinois, trying to arrest Joseph. These guys just peat and repeat. <laughs> well, Judge James Adam discovered this plan while in an unrelated conversation with Governor Ford. He sent a warning to Joseph. Now, since Joseph was en route to Dixon, William Clayton and Stephen Markham rode 212 miles in 64 hours to warn Joseph of the impending danger. Now, Joseph was extremely grateful for their concern, but he felt he was safe and he did not want to return to Nauvoo. Well, these arresting officers that we've talked about disguised themselves as Mormon missionaries and were successful in kidnapping Joseph. Joseph was then imprisoned overnight in a local tavern and denied legal help. Well, the neighborhood was aroused, and they detained the arresting officers. Brother Markham obtained a warrant for the arrest of the two sheriffs for kidnapping Joseph and threatening the life of him. Well, the two sheriffs were then arrested by Sheriff Campbell of Lee County. Meanwhile, Brother Clayton returned to Nauvoo and, with Hiram's help, called out the Nauvoo Legion. So this is getting rather complicated. Eighty men went upriver on the Maid of Iowa, and 175 men rode out on horseback to ensure that Joseph was never taken to Missouri. Well, Sheriff Campbell was convinced by Joseph that the court of jurisdiction for this particular case was in Nauvoo. This group now consisted of two sheriffs in the custody of another sheriff and Joseph in the custody of the two sheriffs who were under arrest. Now, this made an interesting and even amusing sight as they were met by the Nauvoo Legion en route to Nauvoo. The municipal court of Nauvoo discharged Joseph on the grounds that the writ against him was illegal. Governor Ford then later upheld the decision. Well, the summer of 1843 was busy for the prophet. Authority had been given the saints in March of 1842 for the construction of their own Masonic Lodge in Nauvoo, the cornerstone being laid June 24, 1843. Now, the prophet was accustomed to receiving many important and famous guests at his home, but perhaps none more important than those who showed up on July 2nd. Joseph conducted interviews and in, was entertained by several Potawatomi Indian chiefs who heralded him as their chief. Okay, I'm going to take some time now and I'm going to discuss my take on Joseph's involvement in the concept of polygamy. Um, I feel that this was Joseph's greatest hour and as you'll see as I go through this presentation, I feel polygamy actually saved the church. I want to begin by first defining a word called foreordination. Foreordination. In the pre mortal spirit world, God appointed certain spirits to fulfill specific missions during their mortal lives. This is called foreordination. Foreordination does not guarantee that individuals will receive certain callings or responsibilities. Such opportunities come in this life as a result of the righteous exercise of agency. 
For ordination came as a result of righteousness in the pre-mortal existence. Now, the doctrine of foreordination applies to all members of the church, not just to the Savior and his prophets. Before the creation of the earth, faithful women were given certain responsibilities, and faithful men were foreordained to certain priesthood duties. As people prove themselves worthy, they are given opportunities to fulfill the assignments they then received. Now, the date of July the 12th, 1843, in my opinion, will be, will be recorded in the heavenly record on high as Joseph's greatest test of his noble foreordination. The revelation on celestial marriage, Doctrine and Covenants 132, was dictated by Joseph and written down in the presence of Hiram Smith by William Clayton. The preface to section 132, and I'll read it right off the slide, says... Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet at Nauvoo, Illinois, recorded July 12, 1843, relating to the new and everlasting covenant, including the eternity of the marriage covenant and the principle of plural marriage. Although the revelation was recorded in 1843, evidence indicates that some of the principles involved in this revelation were known by the prophet as early as 1831. And certainly, yes, they were. This revelation had been alluded to on a number of occasions, but had actually never been written down. Hiram urged Joseph, write the revelation down by way of the Urim and Thummim. That's interesting to contemplate that the Urim and Thummim was still had and apparently used as late as 1843. But Joseph said to Hiram, I do not need to, for I know the revelation perfectly from beginning to end. This principle had been weighing on Joseph's mind for many years. It was explained in part to him in February of 1831. Joseph became concerned about passages in the scriptures in Genesis, which, when he was translating the Old Testament, referred to the many wives of the ancient prophets, prophets like Abraham, Esau, Jacob, Moses, and David. He inquired of the Lord why these men were blessed, when by standards of Joseph's day, they would be under condemnation. He was told the purpose was to, quote, raise up a righteous seed unto me. So there's purpose number one, to raise up a righteous seed unto me. Now I'm going to share with you three purposes that I think are so important with regards to polygamy. But that's obviously uh, one of the purposes to raise up a righteous seed unto me. Joseph was told more than once that if you ask and you're told, you'll need to obey. Well, Joseph asked and attempted to obey. In an effort to restore all ancient biblical doctrines and practices, there's some evidence to suggest that Joseph entered into a polygamous relationship briefly in February of 1833. Well, this effort by Joseph to practice what he had come to know from the Lord was an absolute disaster. Joseph did not have at this time the knowledge or the understanding of the principles involved in this doctrine. Now, Richard Van Wagner observed that, quote, the difficulties of practicing polygamy in 1835 seriously hampered Joseph Smith's apparent enthusiasm for plural marriage. So there were some real challenges during this particular time. Actually, challenges to the point that Joseph left Kirtland and went on a mission, quote-unquote, to Canada until uh, the, f the fire had uh, been distinct extinguished. Now, the next evidence of a pl of plural wivery surfacing was a polyandrous relationship in Far West in 1838. Now, this was a paper marriage with the woman remaining and living with her original husband. Now, the definition of polyandry, polyandrous, the condition or practice of having more than one husband at one time, a paper marriage, the second husband not living with the woman. Okay. Now, nothing further is known until after Nauvoo was established. During the spring of 1842, Joseph was visited by an angel with a drawn sword who told him it was time to obey the commandment, or as I've totaled, titled this particular slide, to fish or cut bait. It was now time to separate the wheat from the tares. 
There are 20 different reminiscences from such notables as Lorenzo Snow, Benjamin F. Johnson, Orson Pratt, and Brigham Young that recount Joseph's encounter with this sword-bearing angel who commanded him to establish the practice of plural marriage or be slain. Helen Mar Kimball Whitney stated, quote, Had it not been for the fear of the Lord's displeasure, Joseph would have shrunk from the undertaking and would have continued silent as he did for years. Joseph put off the dreaded day as long as he dared. Lucy Walker reported, Joseph had his doubts about it, for he debated it in his own mind. Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner recalled, Quote, Joseph told me he was afraid when the angel appeared to him twice and told him to take other wives. He hesitated, and the angel appeared to him a third time with a drawn sword in his hand and threatened his life if he did not fulfill the commandment. Erastus Snow said, quote, Joseph had to plead on his knees before the angel for his life. Well, no other episode in Joseph's personal history records a near-death, life-threatening incident with the Lord. Joseph's foot-dragging provoked the heavens as never before. At one point in 1843, Joseph lamented to Levi Hancock, Brother Levi, if I should make known to my brethren what God had made known to me, they would seek my life. Also, in 1843, Joseph observed, Men will say, I will never forsake you, but will stand by you at all times. But the moment you teach them some of the mysteries of God that, they, that are retained in the heavens and are to be delivered to the children of men when they are prepared, they will be the first to stone you and put you to death. I feel Joseph knew that this principle would eventually cost him his life. Joseph said, God commanded me to obey the law. And unless I introduced it and practiced it, I, together with my people, should be damned and cut off from this time henceforth. This slide, I think, is very thought-provoking. Joseph said, The best way to obtain truth and wisdom is not to ask from books, but go to God in prayer and obtain divine teachings. Now, this is what Joseph did. However, at this time, Joseph had more knowledge and a much greater grasp on eternal principles and the gospel plan. Liberty Jail had aided in that process. Joseph had been primed and prepared, and his tutor was none other than the Lord. In Liberty Jail, he was told, My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine, adversary, thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a, for a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou art called to pass through tribulation, and these things shall give thee experience, and shall be for thy good. Well, Joseph knew this to be a necessary principle from which a great deal of good would eventually come. He also knew, like Zion's camp, this test would determine once and for all who the most righteous and valiant saints would be. And so now we come to purpose number two the separation of the wheat and the tares. So you're going to raise a righteous seed to the Lord, but you're going to separate right now, just literally prior to Joseph's death, the wheat from the tares, the good from the bad, the valiant from those who would fall. The church would eventually grow from plural marriage, despite its opposition against it. Now, I want to... Uh, I want to, this slide to be an important slide for you to understand and concept for you to grasp. There were at least nine significant splinter groups that formed after the death of Joseph and Hiram. Such groups as the Cutlerites, Strangeites, the Bickertonites, the Whiteites, the Rigdonites, the Hedrickites, the Josephites, a lot of ites. Well, these groups drew many, many, many saints away from the church. However, the nucleus of the twelve apostles, those that were linked in plural marriage, in polygamy, stayed together, never wavering. I might point out that these groups, for the most part, never practiced polygamy, and yet today are, for all intents and purposes, non-existent. Yet the group who did practice polygamy, the nucleus of the twelve apostles, stayed intact, and these marriages 
that would take place in Nauvoo would cement and link the most righteous leadership families together, creating a safety net that would ensure the survival of the church and establish a foundation for its rebirth in the Utah Basin in 1847. It also did as the Lord said. It separated the wheat from the tares and raised a righteous seed. This is the purpose of polygamy, to save the church, where everybody else splintered off and then fell away and then their churches are non-existent today. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is grateful for those who did practice polygamy. Because of it, the safety net was formed. Now, there are 33 well-documented plural marriages to the Prophet Joseph Smith. Once instituted in the church, there were never more than 2, maybe 3% of the righteous priesthood holders ever practicing it. Now, Brigham Young, somebody we kind of chuckle about with regards to polygamy, he had a very difficult time accepting this concept of plural marriage. Quote, I was not desirous of shrinking from any duty, nor of failing in the least to do as I was commanded, but I was, the, I was for the first time in my life desirous of the grave. I could hardly get over it for a long time, and when I saw a funeral, I felt to envy the corpse situation and to regret that I was not in the coffin. After this revelation was formally written down, Joseph asked Hiram to present it to Emma, hoping her feelings had been tempered perhaps over the last ten years. In returning from the task, Hiram said, and I quote, I have never received a more severe talking to in my life. Emma is very bitter and full of resentment and anger. However, Eliza R. Snow a plural wife of the prophet, and others testify that Emma did give consent to at least four of Joseph's wives and taught them the doctrine and urged them to accept it. Well, despite Emma's personal feelings, this was to be Joseph's greatest challenge and perhaps his greatest hour. President Wilford Woodruff received a revelation 47 years later in September of 1890, showing him what would happen to the church in the future if they continued to practice plural marriage. After this vision, he determined that for the temporal salvation of the church, plural marriages would come to an end and would cease. The manifesto was issued on October the 6th, 1890, and the church submitted to the laws of the land. In Doctrine and Covenants section 124, verse 49, it says, quote, When enemies hinder the work, it behooveth me to require that work no more at the hands of those sons of men. Now, I raise the question, perhaps we should have asked earlier, should we continue polygamy? This particular slide, I therefore, as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, do in the most solemn manner declare that these charges are false. We are not teaching plural marriage nor permitting any person to enter into that practice. And I deny that any other number of plural marriages have during the period been solemnized in our temples or in any other place in the territory. It might have been nice to have stopped polygamy, plural marriages prior to the manifesto, but we didn't ask. Well, Joseph accomplished what he was asked to do, and because of what he accomplished, he'll be exalted. Okay, that's going to conclude our podcast for today. I hope it's given you some interesting thoughts to think about and aids and assist you in your further study of the Doctrine and Covenants. Next time we meet, we'll be going into part three of the Passport to Heaven, Joseph's Experiences in the Nauvoo Era. Thank you for watching. This Come Follow Me video series is a bonus resource to enhance your appreciation of the Prophet Joseph Smith with little known facts and research about American and church history. Thank you for listening today and for sharing this ComeFollowMe2021.com website. We sure appreciate those who have been contributing on our Patreon page under Latter-day Media. We'll have a link in the show notes and we would love to invite more to help support this work. To contact Kay, email him at footstepsofjoseph at gmail.com.